Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. My name is Linda Cook. I'm the CEO of Edmonton Public Library, and it's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker to you today. Stephen Abram, MLS, is a past president of the Special Libraries Association, a past president of the Ontario Library Association, and also of the Canadian Library Association. He recently joined uh, Dysart and Jones Associates after leaving his position as vice president for strategic partnerships and markets for Gail Sengage. Sengage. He was Vice President Innovation for Circe Dynex and Chief Strategist for the Circe Dynex Institute. He has been Vice President of Corporate Development for Micromedia, ProQuest, and Publisher, Electronic Information for Thompson. He ran libraries for Suncor, Coopers & Librand, Smith Lyons, Torrance Stevenson, and Meyer & Hay Group. Stephen has been listed by Library Journal as one of their first movers and shakers, the key people influencing the future of libraries and librarianship. He has been awarded the Special Library Association's John Cotton Dana Award, as well as being a fellow of the SLA. He was Canadian Special Librarian of the Year and Alumni of the Year for the Faculty of Information Studies at the University of Toronto, where he is also an adjunct professor. He gives well over 90 international keynotes keynote talks annually to library and information in industry conferences and writes articles and columns for Information Outlook, Felicitor, Access, Multimedia and Internet at Schools and Library Journal. He is the author of ALA Edition's best-selling Out Front with Stephen Abram. His blog, Stephen's Lighthouse, is an extremely popular blog in the library sector. When I think about Stephen and his talks, I'm always reminded of the very popular box of chocolates quote from Forrest Gump. You never know what you're going to get. <laughs> However, with Stephen, he is like one big chocolate that contains all the flavors. Be prepared to be provoked, challenged, educated, entertained, and perhaps even a little offended. But also be prepared to come away with new ideas and new ways of thinking about the future of libraries. Please join me in welcoming Stephen Abram. <laughs> An introduction from Linda Cook is like a box of chocolates, you never know what you're going to get. <laughs> she once called me the hippo of libraries. <laughs> and it's very sweet. <laughs> It's, it's so much fun to be here at Edmonton Public Library as one of the leading institutions in Canada. People look to this library for innovation. And I'm here to talk about Expect More, which is, okay, you can't rest on your laurels. You're pretty awesome. What's the uh, next step? Which is, your community expects more. Everybody expects more from you. You need to push the envelope. And so I think it's interesting when we look at libraries and the glass ceiling that libraries represent, Oh, we're just about books, books, nothing but books. Or I go to websites and see logos that are based on books, and I see you telling people you have books. They're going, you have a bigger problem in your community if you have to tell them you have books. <laughs> like, I think there's stuff that we do that's significantly more important that we need to spend more time talking to the world about. And it's part of the glass box of librarianship that we see walls around ourselves, or we see libraries as the center of our community instead of the community as the center of the community, and the library is a place within it that makes connections. And so how do we start to build strategies to see the community first and then the library's role in it, rather than managing libraries as part of a community? And Edmonton's taken a very big, strong community focus, but how do we upend the model from the community in? and break through that glass box, and I love this, you know, librarian power <laughs> symbol, <laughs> to actually make a, a bigger difference. And it requires us to deal with some, like, you know, the first step in any 12-step program is admitting there's a problem in the first place. So one of the problems is librarians who know they're introverts but define themselves as shy. Being introverted has nothing to do with shyness, it just talks about you know, normal human populations are 70% extroverted, 30% introverted, and librarians, publishers, and IT types are 70% introverted, 30% extroverted, which means they need to plan to get out in the community, can do perfectly fine and excellently working as presenters, as uh, communicators. And in fact, they're probably better than me, because I, you might, if anybody who knows me know I have 0% introversion. <laughs> and, uh, 
and, and, you know, every once in a while, oh, what came out of my mouth? I didn't know till it came out. <laughs> now that I work for Dice Art and Jones, the rule is there are like six words I'm not allowed to say. I think there's one from George Carlin's list that I'm allowed to say, and <laughs> the rest of them, no. So now, now I don't know what's going to come out of my mouth, but I admire the people who can go before boards of directors or community groups and talk about the relationships we need to have and be interactive. And so I'm going to show a video of what I think libraries are about. And it's a bit of a metaphor. Some of you might have seen this one before. Now, I'm an old man, so the glasses go on. And... Your sting room full stops my skin Dodge and scratch, scratch, now I'm if you've ever been on the moors of England, every night, every single night, a hundred to a quarter million birds take to the air just to play. They get up in the air, they never bump into each other. They adjust based on the wind currents, and they're just having fun. And it's one of the most beautiful sights in the world. And hold me tight and I'll sink in. I'll the dance changes with the weather. On one of these videos, a hawk comes in. And as a group, they chase it away. I like to think of the hawk as someone who wants to cut a library budget. <laughs> Every once in a while, someone breaks away and creates a new dance. So are the birds your community? Are you the hawk? How do we let someone break away and try a new dance? And see if the others learn how to dance and play that game? So you look at the teams in libraries and the way everybody has to play together. Are you the hunter? Are you the hunted? Are you the person who choreographs some of these dances? Look at the length of that thing. It's like a hundred miles long. Or it's England or Canada, 100 kilometers. Think of the variety of formats we have to deal with now, the variety of interactions, the variety of people in our communities. Libraries are incredibly complex, not complicated. We're an ecosystem. So I love that video just to think about how we do things. I also think it's pretty inspirational. Because every day... My microphone clip is a hair clip. Are we a female-dominated profession or what? <laughs> every day in every way, libraries throw something in the water and create a ripple effect. And what do we measure? We measure the pebbles, not the ripples. We don't measure the impact of what we really do in our communities. So when we actually look at research that does measurements that if a school system partners with a public library, we get a five point increase in standardized testing scores. If we have a school library, we get a 20, 25 point increase in standardized testing scores. It's the number one thing you can do other than being a parent who reads to your kids that will change whether kids are successful or not in school. When we invest a dollar in a library, we get on average six to seven dollars in economic return. In the States, it's actually quite higher, but we had to scale it back to just the absolutely hard provable numbers to get Jeb Bush to believe it. When Jeb Bush tried to close all the libraries in Florida, and he's the smarter brother. <laughs> and so when we look at how we're going to build the future, we need to sit there and say, okay, the future is confusing. That's why it requires professionals. 
It's why it requires people with a library education who understand how in the information dance plays out in communities, how learning happens, how community happens. It's not about transactions like circulation numbers. That's our foundation. And the foundation of libraries is really important. Systems, collections, books, and whatever. But all you do with a foundation is you build something on top of it. And you've got to decide if that foundation is a house or a home. As long as we describe libraries as their collections, their rooms, their buildings, we're not describing a home. A home, something happens in. You're designing something where families interact, where communities are built, where children for the next generation grow up. And so what happens in a library that's actually going to change society? I like to think of us as social engineers. And I think our most uh, important attribute is how subversive we are. I really love those librarians who say, oh, you're trying to ban my penguin has two daddies? <laughs> I think I'll order a hundred copies. <laughs> Because I don't think anybody should be absented from society based on who they are. I, your mom won't let buy you books? Well, come to the library. We'll get you some books. You want to be read something? Come on, sit with me. I'll read to you. You want to get your degree? Well, we'll help you. There's almost nothing that we can't help someone with. And we're measuring circulation instead of the impact we have on reading, sharing, community learning, and the progress society can make? How do we start to actually choose to have strategies that are aligned with the differences we make in society? And it's simple, really. Shift happens. Get over it. It's not that hard. My standard quote here is something I'm not allowed to say, but really, pull the pickle out of your ass. <laughs> there is absolutely no way that we need to get really, really better at some of the responsibilities of libraries for our foundations. We're pretty awesome at it. Sometimes we need to make it a little better so we can free up time to do things that are about the social life of libraries, not the technical life of libraries. So we know that users and communities are going to become more diverse. We're in Canada. We're amongst the most diverse countries in the world. Our urban centers are even more diverse. Expectations around timeliness will increase significantly. The risk around timeliness is I can deliver something faster that's somewhat evil. So if you look at the top, last week I put up a post on my blog, said here's the top 25 sites on the internet, top 25 largest. More than half of them are content spam pages. eHow, direct media sites, uh, AOL, Huffington Post, where, contact, where content is contracted for to change the Google search engine rankings. So I can contract to have 5,000 sites built on a political opinion that I want to pr promote. If you want to see what's being done right now, just search gun control and Obama. Or if you, know, if you want, you know, you're going to get the best results saying birth certificate and Obama, or global warming and Harper. When we hire hundreds of librarians and editors to write sites and do search engine optimization to change the search engine rankings. So when we look at, I got it fast, is it right? You know the first 100 pages you link to on a Girdle search result that 98% of them on the drug your doctor just prescribed to you were written by the drug company. Because the drug company doesn't want to have to tell you the drug contra interactions or it wants to decline that. So if you're reading People Magazine, you see three pages of information after every ad that tells you somewhere, <laughs> you're going to get suicidal thoughts. Or you're going to get anal leakage on this diet <laughs> medicine. You know, it's really not something they want to say over the dinner hour when they're paying extra for the commercial that this diet food gives you anal leakage. You know, they tried for years to make a four-hour erection sound like a benefit. <laughs> so they, the content spam companies like Direct Media that went public for 6.9 billion after it was six months old, writes contract content for the auto companies, for the drug companies, for the appliance companies, to make sure that the first sites that you get on the web are there. Like how many of you paid money to Google in the last couple of months? Not many, I'll, I'll hazard a guess. So you're not their customer. You are not their target end user, you are their product. 
How many of you would buy licensed databases for your library where the algorithm was written to serve up the commercial needs of racist organizations, commercial entities, politicians? Google had a banner year, made $50 billion in profit last year because there was a political race. And as long as you have an election, there's a lot of politicians paying money to promote and geotarget. The company I used to work for spent a lot of money with Google changing the search engine rankings and the ads and the sponsorships on every college and university campus in North America because you can buy the geotag set to target things individually. So a politician can change it. We should know that as librarians, but we should also know that that's the difference between what a library offers and what Google, Bing, and the others offer. They're trying to get better at the spam, but spam Content spam is a key part of their business model. We're going to have a foot in both camps for many years to come, digital and print. We're professionals. We are not allowed to talk about the death of print or we just, well, it's only Apple browsers are any good or Apple devices because that's just fanboy behavior. That's not a professional attitude. We got to sit there and say, while we're in all these camps, we're managing the hybrid nature as we move forward. And sometimes print's going to be the right answer, and sometimes electronic is going to be the right answer. Sometimes we're going to have to target everything at every device. We aren't allowed to sit there and say, gee, I love Apple. Of course, I particularly love Apple's way it censors books in the iStore. Uh, I'm, I'm amazed at the number of librarians who aren't incensed that a vendor should be allowed to censor books or ban books out of its store. How many of you would let yourselves ban a book? Say a Pulitzer Prize winning novel. Yet you can't buy some Pulitzer Prize winning novels in the Apple store because they're satire and they criticize other governments or other people. I personally think that's sort of offensive. Or, okay, well, that's, it offends my library value system. Why are we letting it happen? Content is already dominated by non-text. Does your collection have that same balance in it? Gaming, art, visuals, audio, how do people learn? You can download every Gale book or article as an MP3 file and listen to it in your car or on your iPod. How are you promoting that sort of service for your auditory learners or your runners? Like nothing like listening to an article on arthritis while you're running. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to fix it and then going, oh my god, I just heard something really interesting. Search is exploding with options. It's not to us to sit there and say, I want all my library services to run like Google. Because that single search box is a piece of crap for how and why questions. It's really good for who, what, when, where. Simple reference questions, references emerged as being something Google does fairly well. If I type in pizza, I really want to know a pizza in Edmonton. I don't want the pizza shop that's got the most hits in Chicago. So when we're looking at geotagging and influencing search rankings on who, what, where, when, it does pretty good. When I say, how should I write a small business marketing plan? Why do I want the first page to be all the consultants in Edmonton that, will, that I can pay to write a small business marketing plan for me? Instead of going to the library and being able to get articles and books and stuff that I can start to oh, keep myself aware. Maybe I need to hire a consultant, but not. The single purpose anchored device if anything has declined in market share, it's the desktop, including desktop design. If we can get something out of our uh, way we talk, is designing for desktops. I like to design for humans. I think they're actually using the machine. I don't think I'm marketing to test desktops or to screen size or anything like that. I need to market to a user experience. And not usability, but a real user experience that I'm impacting someone transforming them emotionally and in the space of their knowledge, the way we really do when we're working interpersonally with somebody. When a kid in grade six comes up to the reference desk upstairs and asks about divorce, we're pretty sure they're writing a family studies essay and we give them a little reference interview to make sure we know that, and then we get them what they need. When a 32-year-old woman comes up to the reference desk and says, I want to know something about divorce, sort of thin-lipped, we're pretty sure she's trying to get rid of 185 pounds of ugly fat. <laughs> and, and we ask some different questions. 
And we might get up from our desk, we might put our hand on our shoulder and say, do you have a lawyer yet? We've got, what level can you do? Like, you know, looking at the law is not going to help, but we have some self counsel press stuff. Do you need a safe house? That sort of stuff. Like, you know, when we take responsibility for the real reference transaction. When we type divorce into Google, that grade six kid and that woman get the same answer. That's the biggest difference between what we do and what Google does. And what does your family law page look like at a library? Does it deal with the real issues that you see at the reference desk? Or does it just link to a bunch of laws? Those community directories we create, the way we create an experience based on what we're seeing and what we're trying to make a difference, how do we build that space? So the devices are going to focus on social collaboration, sharing, multimedia, and creation. Successful services will align with that. The social web has caught up with social institutions. That's been the biggest change that's happened in our world. The transactional stuff of us retrieving things is gone. The social recommendation, the social life of information, the access to communities based on what Facebook group they're attached to or what Twitter feed they had. You all know that your machine gets different answers on Google because Google tracks your last 100 search results and changes the results. You know that you get a different answer at the University of Alberta through Google than you get at EPL downtown. It's manipulated. And so as we start to look at what kind of services a library should do, what are the social life of information? So when I go on to your web page, what's the critical difference between a library in the public sector and Google? Name 20 employees at Google, other than Sergey and Larry. They're married now, so no one really cares. If you're going to go after a billionaire nerd, you can probably find one. So if I go to your library website, how many librarians do I see? How many library staff do I see? How do I connect with them? How do I know who's your best business librarian? How do I know who's your best storyteller? Who are your rock stars? And if that's your major, major, major critical of difference, that you have people and they don't, is there something you're hiding? Or do you say, I'm shy, I'm an introvert, I can't possibly show my face online. And then you wonder why people don't call you or treat you like the professional you really are? How many anonymous professionals would you hire? Which tax preparer accountant would you go to where he wouldn't tell you his name? Which heart surgeon would you let open your chest where she wouldn't tell you her name? Which lawyer would you engage for your divorce where they would be anonymous? If we want to be professionals in our community, of all the kinds of professionals in a library, I'm not just limiting this to some silly MLS cohort, but all the professionals in a library, are we actually putting ourselves out there? When you look at the librarians who are pushing the envelope, say Justin at Portland Public Library, where his Facebook page is connected to just about every teen in Portland, and he's a little bit crazy, <laughs> and he's unbelievably professional. So you sit there and see a guy who's doing things with the teens that's incredible, and getting into communities there that are challenged. But also, they haven't had a drug problem in that library since he started because he kicked all the drug dealers out. He had courage to make the library a safe place for teens. And so he did the professional thing and he found his courage, which I freaking hell couldn't have done. <laughs> and the kids come in and create things. So the art all over the teen part of the library is something they did. They have a nice whiteboard wall where they can do their graffiti, controls the graffiti. They have a green wall. Cost him $5.99 for a can of paint to be able to uh, do videos against the green wall and edit it on their Mac machines with the standard software that was on the Macs so that they're making videos. They play music and he ties it to the poetry collection in the library. Suddenly the boys are reading poetry, old dead white guys, because they see it as lyrics and the foundation of rap. It's pretty amazing. But it's because he's made himself a brand. He has a cartoon of himself. He's got some pretty interesting stuff. So the real challenge is getting librarians focusing on professional service, not servitude. 
Some of us are providing really, really effective transactional service that's good and polite. That step and fetch at librarianship. It's not scalable. How do we move to the next stage of actually choosing to make a difference in a community that's not just about getting well-liked service, but beloved, respected, and transformational service? How do we take community librarianship up to a level that's absolutely our role in life and making a difference in people's lives, whether it's making that woman safe or making that kid be all that he can be or she can be? And then how do we make sure that we're service professionals and not just servants? And taking everything to the cloud so that we can free up the back room to be in the front room. So if we're trying to create user experiences, they better be virtual. The majority of the use coming into this library and virtually every library on the continent is virtual. Usually when I look at it, it's 75 to 90% of the use comes in virtually through the digital framework. So what does your branch manager look like for virtual? What does the team look like? And what kind of virtual services you're creating that are aligning with things? So, as we try and deal with this, this car juggernaut coming at us, where the expectations are that we need to be what we really are, but we need to be at digital, virtual, and in person. We need to make sure that we have the in-person stuff and the buildings are still relevant, but the balance of what happens in a building is going to change radically. So who are you? I went with a Calgary metaphor. This is a great metaphor for uh, reference librarians who are still cowboys. Sitting on their horse, we call it a desk. Maybe not doing reference by walking around. Maybe not fully, fully adapting the retail model. Management works in teams. Systems works in teams, oftentimes outside of the organization. Collection development works in teams. And librarians in the public service front are often cowboys, creating wonderful one-on-one -on -one experiences or doing training programs that have no scalability and can't be port made portable across every branch or over time. Can we get reference librarianship up to stop the cowboy model and move it into the next generation where we have teams. Like is every reference librarian connected in a Yammer group or something like that, that when they hit a barrier, they can ask the team for stuff? Or do they feel like good, good efficient solo and it's somehow a shame not to know something? Like I know all you reference librarians in the room, no one will play Trivial Pursuit with you anymore. They won't play with me. <laughs> but how do we up our game? What is upping our game? And what are you? I think the library is more the campfire where people talk and share and connect with each other than it is the cowboy on the range. So if we're looking at the campfire, the warmth of a library and its community and how it changes the nature of who knows what, where's the best place to go, it's a good thing. And how do we take our competencies and put them into capabilities that we transfer to our communities? In a knowledge-based economy, in an information-based economy, it's like, you know, sometimes people make the mistake of saying, well, Alberta or Canada is a resource-based economy. Well, all the jobs virtually in those parts of the world are knowledge-based jobs. Environmental engineering is not something that, like, you're digging a hole or fracking is not or cutting down a tree where you've got to do a laser sight on a computer and take a Tech, very technologized machine to chop it off at the bottom and carry it requires a lot of computer ability. There aren't many, you know, we have this lumberman thing that we're a bunch of strong guys in Canada chopping down trees and pulling water and digging with our hands. It's a lovely nostalgic view of how a resource-based economy works, but it's just not true. Our economy works on our minds and our brains, and we're part of that. Because as the knowledge becomes more intensive, we need to be part of preparing our kids for that world and preparing people for the many jobs they're going to have through their lives. So we can take our competencies and take the leadership role that we play in our communities. It doesn't take a genius to see that librarian skills and competencies applied to the trends change communities. 
we really, really do make a difference. But what we like to think is that people will notice without us telling them. Or we like to think that putting what we did on a bookmark is somehow marketing. Oh my God. I've seen bookmark marketing work, but oh my God, there are other ways to do this. What do your video stories look like? How does, how does your viral campaign work? You know, we look at the uh, geeked library campaign that a, libra a lot of librarians like because it doesn't look professional. You know, I don't think we all have to wear blue suits. <laughs> I think bringing our own personality to the game is really important. But bringing all those challenges into our communities and saying, here's the multi-dimensional way we have things. We're not like Amazon that sells books real well. We're not like Google that does search retrieval pretty well for who, what, where, when. We have so many dimensions and facets to our service proposition that we're hard to explain unless we tell stories and tell those stories effectively. Our core skill isn't delivering information. Once we start using nouns like information, we start managing nouns in warehouses of nouns, books, DVDs, stuff like that. The root word of information is a verb, to inform. To inform means to learn. And how do, what role do we play in that space? So what are the verbs you would use to describe a public library? Because whenever we do this exercise in workshops, I get a bunch of nouns in a row describing the library instead of a bunch of stories that use verbs that describe the library effectively. Libraries improve the quality of the question and the user experience. So if someone comes in and asks to help them find a job and they have a job interview, and you give them a book on how to ace the interview or an article on how to ace the interview, instead of finding them a bunch of videos on what modern interviews look like, where does learning happen better for most people? Watching the video not going to our world of text-based learning. We're all pretty good text-based learners, pretty good interpersonally. The real world out there is experience-based learners, visual learners. So are we aligning our services with the width of the way people are? Libraries are about learning and building communities. When I did the study on this, I took 55,000 stories from library end users, not from librarians. Just in case you've ever, we've done it with librarians too, what do you think the overlap is between what librarians think libraries are about and what end users think libraries are about? There isn't any overlap. It was frightening. The end users say by far that they come to the library for, as a community space and as a learning space. And borrowing a book, reading entertainment are much lower down on the, on the curve. People have seasons, and those seasons are incredibly important to us. If we think of public library users as a homogenous group, or we build services so that it's served equally to everyone who holds a card, we're making a huge mistake. It's easy to describe when you make a mistake because you're running a teen genealogy club. When you look at your genealogy, you have a wonderful list of genealogy training on the monitor up top, and it's got big print because it would work for me. I could read it. <laughs> and I'm almost hitting that age where I might get interested in genealogy. <laughs> but, you know, teen, you're not, you don't going to sit there and see most of your audience being teens. The odd geeky one. But that's a very core market. When you run a health program, the teens aren't going to show up to the how to manage your rheumatism and arthritis. They might show up for something health-wise that manage to, matters to them. Although most of the teen health-wise things are things they do online because it's too embarrassing to ask a reference librarian. So what does your teen site look like and do you change the difference in the health information on your health experience portal for teens versus senior citizens versus mid-career? The kind of ways you deal with it are quite different. The, the same, same issues, like the fastest growing HIV positive uh, population in North America right now is seniors. 
because when they were younger, they were the first generation with the pill. And now they're the first generation of widows and widowers with Viagra. But they never went through what our kids went through to say, you know, kids, wear a raincoat. And they think they're safe. So what does STD education look like for seniors versus for teens? And how do we make a difference in the community and have the courage to do that? So when you start looking at the niches of your marketplace, the, li the, the, the seasons are different for different stages of life. We know ourselves that we have different stages. But then there's other demographics in those seasons. So 75% of the people registered in distance education are single moms. That is the sweet spot targeted. It's also one of the largest user groups in public libraries who come in and do things. So when we tied Children's Storytelling Hour at New York Public Library to getting an A research skills training and put it on at the, put it on, on at the same time as the story hour was, because these women care about their children, that's why they're in higher ed, so they can get their salary up. They put their kid into the storytelling hour where they'll be safe and engaged and they're loving it. Then they run upstairs and either work on getting the materials for their paper or go to the training session. New York Public Library had to increase the number of information literacy sessions for people in distance ed by 400% with a strategy that tied it to the fact that they were young moms who knew they needed to finish their BA or whatever. So when we take responsibility, when we say we change people's lives, we do that by taking responsibility for tying programs together where there's an alignment. That makes a difference in society. And it means talking about things that may not be politically correct. And that's librarian magic. We are magical. There's nothing more magical about us because nearly everything we do happens invisibly. We organize information in a back room. We make technology as seamless as we can. We buy things and just put them up there for free. It's not really free. We buy them as a community. But we unfetter it as best we can, the real meaning of free. And the more we unfetter things, the more we look magical. Or when somebody comes up to a desk and they say, oh, she just knew the answer to that. Not that you invested in your training and have deep experience and freaking hell know how to do some stuff. You know, that, oh, here and you pull out a book that no one else can do because you just happen to know that that's the best book for it's going to meet their need or whatever you're pulling out. But how do we get librarians fitter and libraries fitter to meet their needs? I love this one. I got in trouble in the southern US because he was naked. He said, you should have covered that up. I said, it is. He's fat. <laughs> But if we, when we look at the fitness of libraries, it means putting more pressure on ourselves to uh, put more energy into the mix of what we're trying to do. So how do we scale things up? How do we programmatically uh, standardize, not so standardize in a bad way, but make it scalably deliverable? Like if you've got a wonderful program that's delivered at branch X, how do we make it so that everybody can deliver that program if it's an in-person program? And then how do we align it with what's going on at branch Y and branch uh, D or virtually? So if you're telling wonderful children's stories, how many YouTube videos do you have online of your children's storytellers? You have fabulous storytelling skills. You can film them with a freaking iPhone at no charge and load it up on YouTube and build it into your website with embedding in less than 10 minutes. So how many do you have? How many recordings do you have that a parent can download to make those storytelling hours good? When you have talented people, probably in the dozens, who know how to do this, why are we not recording it and making it scalable? It may not be as good as coming to the library, but anyone who's a parent know you can't always stick your kid in the pajamas and stuff their teddy bear in their arm and go to storytelling night at the library. Can I download it and put it on an iPod and stick there? Like my son always wanted 24 stories before he went to bed. <laughs> From his year old, the little bugger. And plus he inherited my hyperactivity, so he would go 24, 48, 72 hours without sleeping. And 
we were going nuts. So we started getting him books on tape and music on tape. You know, the Mozart series where you could do that stuff. And he ended up memorizing all the, to my great pleasure, all the jazz. <laughs> so now he knows jazz and can tell me stuff. <laughs> but when you start to build those storytelling hours, say, okay, we're reading stories to kids, we're doing a good job. When you're telling those stories, you're demonstrating to young mothers who have usually, nowadays in Canada, been out in the workforce for a decade or more before they have their children. They've forgotten how to tell stories. You try and get some young accounting partner track woman to use a high squeaky voice and hold a puppet, they've forgotten that. Whereas we demonstrate that skill. So we show them how to tell stories again, say it's okay to tell puppet stories and go, hey, dicky, 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 dicky. See, I'm even getting embarrassed doing it because I'm not a little children's storyteller. <laughs> but it's an important thing. And every time you do a children's story, do you point out that you have a parenting collection and a child health collection and that it's over there? Do you make that collection relevant to people who would actually use it? In Canada, where our caregiver population is a lot of Filipinos on a special immigration program where they have to take continuing education in order for us to have live-in childcare help. When you see those Filipinos there, do you connect it up to how you can help people find courses and how you can help them with their homework or not? It's the fourth most spoken language in Canada is Tagalog. But how big is your Tagalog collection for them to be home? Are you making those connections? Do you recommend a book, say, uh, we've got 25 copies of Good Night Moon on the shelf. And every page on Good Night Moon, kids don't listen, has a mouse on it. And if your kid can find that mouse at age two, before they're ready to read, it helps them find context on the page. The advanced version is Where's Waldo? But for now at two, find the mouse. And your kid will be better prepared to read when you want them to find the words on the page, which is not intuitive. Or are you just reading stories? Those stories are wonderful. Have you taken pictures of every storytelling hour and put them up on your Instagram, Pinterest, or Flickr site? Because nothing's cuter than the back of three kids' heads in their pajamas with their teddy bear <laughs> and people going, grandmas and parents, going, I want my kid to have that experience. They can take the back of their head because that way you don't even have to get permission to sign off on it because their non-custodial parent won't find them. But they're looking up like this and they're looking in awe at the library. No one's running across the grocery store floor when the Google employee's walking through. But when you put a children's storytelling librarian out in the wild, kids are hugging their leg. <laughs> Off me, kid. <laughs> like, that's a big deal. Or are we describing storytelling hours we tell stories to kids instead of the early years education? The difference we make in young mothering, child health, and parenting. The way we help people understand how to tell stories and train that up. And that storytelling is part of our culture. So when we look into the future, what are we going to look like? What are folks like? Are they different than us? Well, they are now. So you sit there and say, how are kids different? So we know their IQs are 20, 25 point higher than the boomer if they're under 30. You know, we took the lead out of the paint. So when they were chewing on their cribs, that helped. <laughs> we also took the lead out of the, the first generation who grew up with no lead. They're the first generation where the majority of them did gaming. So we know that gaming improves brain function. They have more sulci, more gyri, lighter myelinization on their uh, ganglia. Their brains work faster. They're really, really smart kids. You know, but there's no instinct greater in any population than for one generation to crap on the generation following it. They're going, oh my god, they don't know how to do this. Well, yeah, because they're in grade four. Like, you know, what planet were you on where you knew how to do that in grade four? Totally disrespectful. They get into high school and say, well, they don't know this. It's BS. It's your responsibility to make sure that they learn the things they need to learn as their brain develops. So we got this smart generation of kids. How do we deal with it? They may have little Ferraris for brains, but I could put 120 Ferraris out front here and stick you all in it, and none of you will be able to drive it at 200 miles an hour. It takes some training. So it's our responsibility to build a generation of kids whose brains can meet all they have the potential to meet. When they're ready to do it, like, you know, are you, have you dealt with 
Like, have you had the training sessions in EPL for how the high school curriculum has changed? Because if you're over 25, you aren't, you don't have any idea how they're educated in high school now. So are you making sure you're not answering their questions when they come in in grade 9, 10, 11, and 12? And you're guiding them through the critical thinking that they need? Do you have teachers in the library teaching you how the curriculum has changed? Do you understand the kind of projects they're doing and the collaborative nature of those projects as they're prepared for a society based on teamwork? Or do you have a mental model in your head that they're writing an essay? Which is a rare output. So if we haven't invested in the Western Common Curriculum training on what happens in grade 9 in the four strands and grade 10 and grade 11 and grade 12, you haven't aligned your services with supporting homework help. It's, it's training we need. It's fundamentally different. My education bears no resemblance to what my kids went through and my kids have changed materially for what the post-millennials are going through. Yet we make assumptions that somehow classrooms look like they were when we were there or that teachers teach like they did when we were there. They don't. It's fundamentally different. It's a critical thinking based, engaging curriculum. You look at how articulate these kids are when they're arguing with you at the reference desk. <laughs> My generation didn't do that. They're articulate, questioning, different. And they have to talk every day in class and do presentations to a fairly large group of kids. I did one minute speech in grade six and a five minute speech in grade nine and it terrified me. Whereas kids seem to now to be able to stand up and go on video and do God knows what. <laughs> what world will they experience when they grow up? What will telework look like? What will virtual teams look like? What's the world gonna look like in too much information? When I grew up, finding three articles on the topic was hard. Now it's getting down to three articles that's hard. You have all those skills to teach that and the judgment and the skills to do it. What does it look like when we're teaching them fluency with information? I don't like to call it information literacy because people would have to admit they were illiterate to do it, which is really bad marketing. You know, it's like, I sometimes say, if librarians were running beauty salons, they'd call them ugly salons. Just admit you look like crap and we'll fix you. So, <laughs> you're gonna look great when we're done. And so let's call it information literacy. Just admit you don't know what you're doing and we're brilliant and we will show you how to be great. <laughs> so how can we make a difference is the question we need to be asking. That's very different than how can we help. If you've ever, like I built the training for Marriott Hotels and it's been copied by Ritz-Carlton, Disney and uh, uh, Nordstrom's. At Nordstrom's, we trained everybody not to ask, can I help you? When you walk into Nordstrom's store, they just engage in a conversation with you. Because 50% of people you talk to are insulted if you ask they need help. So why, hasn't, why haven't library land stopped doing that? Did I see it all the time? Can I help you? Do I look like I'm clueless? Do I look like I'm lost? We did a, I, did a, I do these open focus groups at OLA every year. And we had uh, new Canadians this year. And so we, did, so we just asked them questions. They were very generous and they were brilliant. You know, the average new Canadian is significantly less likely to be on welfare than a born in Canada person. Significantly more likely to have a small family, but not a big family. Significantly better educated than the average Canadian. But they have challenges when they enter the country. They actually want the library in the airport in the, every last one of them said they wanted a library brochure as they entered the country. And some, some of the libraries were doing that, which is good. And they said, you can ask me a question, but don't say, am I new to the country? The question they all said they wanted to hear was, you look, are you, new to the, are you new to this library? And then you get permission to uh, engage them in services and programs and uh, things we offer because a lot of the countries they were coming from don't have our library tradition. So how can you make a difference? What are the differences you want to make? So what are the goals? What are their goals? What are your goals? Librarians often want to tell people what we do rather than ask what they want to do. What do we, I, I go to a lot of library websites and say, why are there no pictures on this thing? 
Oh, I had pictures there, but I took them out because there was more I wanted to tell them. And is there a difference between what we tell them and what their goals are? And how do you align with their goals? If you call it information literacy instead of getting an A, or call it uh, genealogical research instead of finding your ancestors, leaving a legacy for your uh, grandkids, how do you engage them with why they're doing it? Do you know why they're doing it? Do you know the three different kinds of genealogical researchers? The ones who are looking for their old dead relatives and hoping one of them was a queen? <laughs> now that we know Canada descended from the Lantagenists, <laughs> you know, the guy who gave his DNA to prove that Richard III was the dead guy in, under the parking lot? <laughs> I put up on my Facebook page, have you started digging up your parking lot? Maybe some library has some. <laughs> And of course, the American ones were saying, we don't have that. So I just said to them, well, look for Jimmy Hoffa. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody is under your parking lot. <laughs> and then we look at the building blocks of what literacy really is. We've been focused on reading for so long. Bad librarians focus on books instead of reading. Like ALA puts out read posters, not book posters. And so, but when we look at the full range of literacies that are required to be in our society now, we have some opportunities. You're not going to get a teen in to talk about internet safety. You'll get their parents in. But if you talk about uh, redesigning your social media presence for teens, how do you pimp your website? That works. And then you sneak in the information literacy stuff that we know they need about privacy and confidentiality and that sort of stuff. So how do we look at the priorities of libraries in this context? And how do we make them sustainable? We are still hand knitting nearly everything. Every question, every website, every program. You know, you can't be hand knitting everything like craft forever. At some point, we've got to start manufacturing some of this stuff. So if we want to teach somebody how to use Chicago Manual of Style, what does the e-learning object on your website look like that supports what the kids are learning in high school now? Or are you giving one-on-one -on -one training all the time? What does your genealogy presence look like? What does your YouTube video look like? What does your e-learning object look like? How do you make yourself boundaryless? That the walls of the library are permeable and that it's fundamentally different. The world is going to change whether we like it or not, get ready. It already has changed. I like libraries that do chalk marketing. You just go buy those, go to Toys R Us and buy those big chalk and start writing on the sidewalk. When you're having your, uh, like you have a gardening collection for plants that'll grow in uh, this climate, such as it is. <laughs> and so, you know, when you have your, uh, when all the branches agree to have a perennial uh, sharing day and people can bring in the perennials that have overgrown their gardens and just chop off a bit and trade them for someone else's perennials. And you've got all the books on book trucks out in the parking lot. You've partnered in such a way that people remember you have a gardening collection and that you have actually built your gardening collection to align with this climate zone, which by the way, Amazon didn't. And nor does Heather. How do we make sure that we support the experience that our users need? Take some accountability, but delegate responsibility to people in the branch to just try new things. I usually use this slide and say, there's that kind of librarian who looks at kids today and says, huh, that kid's going to slice his ass off. <laughs> and then watch the kid do it and take a little glee in it. Like, those are the librarians I want to vote off the island. I love the ones in our profession who run up and stop the kid and say, there's a better way to do that. <laughs> Let me show you. Or here's the card catalog. Or here's a tool that will help you get there. Or here's a better word to use. That's what we're doing well. And when we start seeing that the users are taking new paths rather than the path that was made for them, we don't do this. We, we pave that. <laughs> when we see that they're taking new paths, sometimes we just need to keep it at Oak Greenfield and wait to see where the paths are. Or we learn that they actually don't care about our DRM or our uh, passwords or anything like that. They just go around it. <laughs> and we have to remember that we're not poor. We're probably not as good at setting priorities as we should be. And we're probably doing a lot of stuff that's old and doesn't need to be done anymore. 
For example, interlibrary loans that cost at $35 to $40 each. When 95% of all the interlibrary loans that public libraries do can be bought for less than $5 used on Amazon or the used book or Abbey books. Why are we doing it the most expensive way possible and then believing that's virtuous when we can give away the book to anybody? Are we locked in our library mindsets? Like, do we see structure versus the music? Like, what's happening in that space versus, like, if the bars here are like our buildings and our collections? But this is what people are doing. That's the song they're singing. And that song is pretty amazing, but what are their songs? And when you look at how our libraries are organized, are we organizing them like this? Well, these are all our databases. This is our newspapers, and this is our mag magazines. And come on in and look at our stuff instead of what's the song you're singing. So how can we focus on the real issues and get our head out of the book and into the way the users are behaving, the way our communities are behaving, and what their real needs are around newcomers, kids, seniors, moms, all the things we care about. Or something, if I want to be really challenging, what do we really suck at? Serving men. Really, really, really bad at it. I know, I'm our one. <laughs> and I know, you're mostly not. It starts when they're teen boys, when women have absolutely a very shallow understanding of male puberty. That men get puberty three times and girls only get it once. And so when we don't understand the human development that boys receive, they're growing up so differently. And that sitting still is usually a bad thing for a boy because our hormones pools, pool, women's don't. Until we understand the brain development of women is different, we all end up about the same at 25. But when we lose the boys as teens, we don't always get them back. We often get the kids back because their mom brings it in. When we did surveys of men, what did we get? I don't go into the library because that judgmental bitch on the circulation desk is going to remember my high school fines. <laughs> May not be true. We all know that everybody on the circ desk is a lovely person. <laughs> but that's their fear. And so how do we sit there and come closer to men? What's a male experience? Getting stuck in an hour and a half traffic jam twice a day. Are you marketing your audio books that work in their USB files on their car radio? How are you marketing the auto parts books? Or are they just hoping they trip over them? Are you marketing through the drive to work and drive home from work hours about what you've got? When half the population is being underserved, we have a problem. So we've got to remember that retail sales of books aren't down, titles aren't down, circulation isn't down, reading's not down. In fact, in Canada, we read at three times the rate of Americans, and our teens read at five times the rate of Americans. So when we start telling lies to each other that somehow reading is down, we start making decisions based on a complete and total falsehood. In Canada, we have multiple newspapers in every town. 95% of US cities are down to one newspaper, and it's Republican. When we look at engagement strategies, like Biblio Commons, where you're one of the leaders in Canada on it, and I like Book Psychic too, but uh, uh, the Reader's First strategy that you guys are the leading uh, Beta Delta group on that initiative, does everybody who checks out of the library have someone at the front door, your concierge, your cir circulation desk, whatever, here's, here's a bookmark marketing that might work, we really want you to review that book on our website. We want you to engage with your community. We want you to do this. The way McDonald's gets everybody to say, do you want fries with that? Are we engaging? Or are we just hoping that they'll come to your cornfield because we built it? And when you're asking them that kind of stuff, are they understanding that this is a real engagement strategy where they all start to work together and that it's about Edmonton reviews that other Edmontonians might want to know? And are you all writing reviews on the site of the books you're reading or recommending? As my wife says, read that book. I haven't even recommended it yet. <laughs> because she's often recommending books she hasn't read. So will reading matter? Like, you know, I don't want to read an e-book because it'll, uh, I can't read in the bathtub. Well, this guy's figured it away. 
you know, frankly, my wife reads her Kobo reader in the bathtub. And we're seeing the death of a number of formats. And when we start talking about those formats, like CD-ROM, uh, most of the major publishers stop producing a CD-ROM this month. DVD within the next two years. You're probably getting 30, 35% of your circ from formats that don't exist in the next two years. What's your strategy? Or are you going to keep being addicted to circ numbers that are uh, impossible to continue to grow because the format disappeared and you don't have a streaming media strategy? Scared yet? So how format agnostic are you and how are you turning things in? When you look at, this is a projector, they've got this down to smaller than a sugar cube now, where your videos will come off your phone and you can just download and have it working. That's actual a search browser on a credit card because you can make wireless credit card. Everything's getting smaller. <laughs> and the XML rev revolution is changing the dynamics of things and what we're not acknowledging strongly enough is what's the difference between this and a home phone? When I go into your ILS, am I going to find that you collected home phones or member aligned phone numbers? Do you send notices to home email address or personal email addresses? Do you have one email address for a family card or not? What's the difference? Like, I don't really want you to look at what's on my phone because it's, you'll see all my search stuff. See how lost I get on Google Maps. <laughs> Trying to find Sorrentino's. The, how to get, last time, how do I find Sorrentino's when I'm leaving Edmonton Public Library? <laughs> That's how stupid I am. <laughs> but it also shows what music I listen to. And it'll tell you a lot about me. You'll see, okay, I'm a boy librarian, so it's full of Broadway show tunes, <laughs> which I adore. It's got the entire Wizard of Oz. And it's got Eminem like crazy. Because angry white guy rap is my music. <laughs> and I just love him. And if you go on YouTube, you'll find YouTube videos of Stephen Abram sings Eminem. <laughs> which is, I have to tell every job interview, you're going to find this. This is how it is. Me in a leather jacket, like, you know, using all the swear words. But when you get to a personal device, have you aligned your relationship with your communities and your users at a personal level? Or do you have some 1950s rosy-tinted view of a home that the family phone sits in the front hall and that mom and dad are going to tell the kid that their book's in on hold? Have you actually tuned it? to who wants to be texted to, who wants to be emailed to, who wants to have a phone call. It would take 90 days to get 80% of your users by asking everybody who comes in and out of the library to upgrade their record. It's their choice if they want to. You don't have to have that 100% fixation, but how do we do that? So pay attention to mobile, it's really important. And what do your mobile apps look like? There's a whole bunch of free ones you can use. But is your catalog, uh, do you have a mobile app, Lachlan? Yeah, okay, you got one, good. And you, do you have the Gale app and all that stuff that lets people access the databases from their phone? Be more open to comment. Sometimes one of the biggest barriers on Biblio Commons is, oh my God, people are gonna say stuff. They might swear. Surprise, people do. Be more open to criticism and feedback. It's not that you're being criticized, it's how you react to it. It's not hard to react effectively. Be more open to recommendations. I love penguins, so that's why that picture's there. <laughs> Support aspiration. What do your users want to do? That single mom who wants to get her degree, what's her aspiration, how do you align with that? That person who's looking for the job, are they looking for an article or are they looking for self-esteem and confidence and what are you doing to make sure you're doing that? When you're, anything you're supporting, when that kid's on homework and they're a little bit stressed. I've, I've actually seen people criticize them for being stressed. I'm going, surprise? Were you some superhuman 10-year-old? How do you be creative? This is Ronald McDonald as a baby. <laughs> and how do you get people's, like, you know, McDonald's did very good on attracting my attention to that ad, so I stole it. 
But what attracts attention? You've got a branding program that uses bright colors. It's attractive. It's got clever sayings. Have you moved that farther down into your personal branding? So what does your teen librarian Facebook page look like? Not the one where you connect up with your friends and stuff. Just make a different page. You know, then you can hide your S&M strategy or whatever. <laughs> and keep your teen page separate and be more fun and all that sort of stuff. But are you connecting at a personal level with your users? I had one children's librarian said, Stephen, I read stories to three-year-olds. Why the hell do I need a Facebook page? So in one of those moments where I didn't think before I spoke, I said, oh, are they driving themselves to the library now? She got it. Two weeks later, she said, I hate you. <laughs> Attendance has doubled. I've got 100 friends now of all the top moms on my Facebook page. I'm, t I'm, I'm sitting there telling when the storytelling hours are, what else should I put on the page? And I said, okay, well, connect to the best-selling new parenting book that just came out, like it was Terry Brazelton at the time. Do that sort of stuff. Next thing you know, she's engaging in a multifaceted way with the uh, young parents in her community and able to say, okay, you know, the reason why we have st storytelling nights, pajama nights, is so that you can just take them home and put them to bed. That's a benefit to the parent, not the kid. So your career has seasons. How are you empowering new librarians and younger librarians who come into your institution? Most of us who are old like me have some pretty good soft skills and some pretty good faked up technology skills. As opposed to young librarians who have some pretty good technology skills, but in no way have they fully developed advocacy, leadership, management, HR, and all the skills you need to run this library. Because we have a demographic dysfunction of a very small generation between the millennials and the boomers, until we start to treat new librarians as new peers instead of as our children. And until we start to treat older librarians as having some skills that could be understood, we're having a bit of a dysfunction in how we're having discussions in our field and that needs to end. We need to be more open to change. Change isn't a bad thing. But change, if you have to reframe it in your head as renewal, renaissance, Adaptation, the dinosaurs didn't go extinct because the climate changed. The dinosaurs went extinct because they didn't adapt to the climate change. We're little mammals. We can probably do it. If we think of the library as a sandbox and say, Branch, why? You're gonna try a new gaming kind of night. Branch X, you're going to try uh, the, the uh, Lego uh, robotics game and we're gonna to try to get girls and boys clubs. Why do you do girls and boys clubs? Not to separate the genders, but to let the girls learn science, technology, engineering, and math education independently from the boys. And then you have the teens compete with each other. So how can you build in, like you know all the Lego stuff is scaffolded from preschool right through to university. The CAD CAM software is there at educational discounts for libraries. You can even use a 3D printer to make custom Lego box. You can build robotics, you can learn how to use instructions, or you can use Duplo and Megablocks when they're little. What's the sandbox you're doing and how are you doing it? So that you're playing. See, he eventually grew up. <laughs> how do we sit there and understand play as a learning strategy and that fun in the library is a better thing? We can do that. And how do we support everybody on the team? <laughs> Now, I was told that there's two things that happen here. One is, as long as one of you falls in and doesn't get eaten, everybody knows it's safe to swim. <coughs> Which, you know, might be how we treat some of our innovators in libraries when they're trying something new. But we need to develop a different culture around innovation, play, experimentation, and pilots. And if we work with those pilots, and then to get stuff, like one of our challenges is getting things out of pilot mode and into the mode that works. So maybe we can need to be a little bit more flexible. We can't bet the entire institution because you're a public institution. Pilots and experiments are safe ways to try things. It's much more dangerous not to try pilots and stay the way you are. Right now, if we stay the way we are, we cannot become all we can be. If libraries, want to be 
what they are, they have to change. If we don't change, we can't remain what we are. We have an opportunity with social software to be engaged social institutions and not just good resource warehouses. So how do we get to be more open to risk? This guy's probably a little happier. Be a little happier when someone follows him or her. We need to be more open to a mosaic of solutions. That's what ambiguity is. We're in a really ambiguous moment. We don't know the right answer. No one can tell you the right answer. All they can say is try a couple of things. So be more open to ambiguity. Actually, I think that's the biggest life skill right now is we have no idea what a tablet's going to look like. If you looked at CES last month, you got phablets and phones with two sides. It's getting weirder and weirder by the minute. My uh, nephew programmed the new Pebble Watch. I don't know if you know the Pebble Watch, but it was one of the big Kickstarter projects. Have you guys done a Kickstarter yet? <coughs> There's seven or eight places where you can get money now for special projects. <coughs> All sorts of libraries are trying it, like San Rafael got to buy 12 guitars for their music program. The boys come in, the girls come in, they play their guitars, then they get to the poetry collection, they write the music, and then they do a performance. They put in a stage. The stage isn't like this, it's like that. They just put a box there where someone can stand up and play at any given moment. They got a second-hand piano, they got all that stuff. Really makes a difference. Oh, noise in the library. Oh my God, wouldn't that be bad? <laughs> like, you know, we see the annoyed librarian who is the shallowest, stupidest thinker in our field saying, you know, well, look at that. This report says that people want quiet in libraries. Well, duh. No one's saying you can't have a quiet spot. But to make the entire library quiet is the biggest form of stupidity you can possibly do. So how do we make sure we have quiet zones? And how do we make sure we have zones where people can talk and discuss and lock down their knowledge and learn and have both? But to take the conversation black and white is the stupidest thing. We can, professionals don't have black and white conversations. Be more open to social technologies and the unintended consequences. Get more comfortable with speed. Things might loo work, run a little faster than we're comfortable with. And more open to new ideas. We used to have exercises where no idea is a bad idea. Yeah, there's a lot of bad ideas. Like, you know, ovens for Jews. Bad idea. Like, the, like those were bad ideas. But there is... But every idea is worthy of conversation and discussion, even if it is to say this idea has some components of evil to it, we might want to stop. We might want to get rid of our control fixation. Librarians, I can answer every question and I can organize all the world's knowledge. There's no control fixation in that. <laughs> How do we take that control and say our ability to do that opens up a world of things. We can remove the borders inside libraries, remove the borders in the library community. We can bridge between community groups and ethnic groups and schools and gardens and commercial entities or whatever. Move the barriers between our libraries and our users, like barcodes. Remove the barriers between libraries and influencers so that they influence for us. And we're pretty inspirational if we think about it. And we got to start acting like we're important. Kirk, Spock, McCoy, and Ensign Ricky are beaming down to the planet. Guess who's not coming back? So, who is it? Oh, Linda, you're the only one wearing a red shirt today. <laughs> but realistically, if we don't think we're important, why would anyone else? If we don't start talking about how important we are and the difference we make in communities and learning and the success of our citizens, what's going to have to do? How are we going to show what makes us different? We are way different than Google. Let's stop competing with them. Let's start creating a conversation about how we're different and what difference we make. Find our voice and use it. And I talked about that. So what should a public library priorities be? Community focus. But if you don't know your li local library community demographics, you're in trouble. You need to focus on a needs assessment and social assessments. What's messed up in your community? Does this community have a need to lift up uh, people who are off reserve in Edmonton? Does this community have a need to uh, make sure that young mothers uh, empower their children with reading? Does this community have an economic need 
to be prepared for the jobs that will be here. So what does your learning system look like? Pri make your priorities smart. Oh yeah, this is, if you had Ken Haycock here, you know he says, all libraries want to be like uh, the Hard Rock Cafe. Love all, serve all, save the world. It's nothing, it means nothing. It's a nice thing to slap on a wall. You want priorities that are smart, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time bound. So when you set a priority, by the end of this year, we will have uh, three virtual presences on our website that engage users on the top three questions asked in our community that make a difference. Whatever you're doing. And then look for partnerships that add value. So if you're saying, we help people find jobs, and the YMCA is the primary place where you can get cheap testings of what you learn, then what's your partnership with the Y look like? And it, it had a branding change, right? It's neither young, male, Christian, or an association. Library needs a branding change too. So programs, up your game. Align with collections. Every single collection in a library must be justified by a program. What does your gardening program look like? You've got a cookbook collection. What does your sink and stove look like? Even if you've only got a crock pot there and a uh, wok, can you cook a meal in the library and show teens how to cook? Can you, okay, she said, give me the move along. <laughs> so, experience portals, up your game on that. Align with collections and add virtual experiences. What are your top 20 questions? If you don't know that, what business are you in in the first place? How can you not know your top 20 questions? I can give you the survey to do that if you haven't done it, but if you're not organizing yourself around your questions and you still think you're only about recreational reading, then you miss something along the way. Learning strategies. You should start offering diplomas and certificates. Can I take my high school in your library? Can I get a certificate in project management or Microsoft Certified Engineering? Or can I learn how to play a guitar here? You can do all that now. There's lots of vendors that will sell it to you. You could become the complete IT environment for your town and prepare people for the jobs that will exist. Real educational opportunities, not just adjacencies, helping people with their homework, but helping them actually get high school. I talked about homework earlier and understand the Western Congress curriculum, know what pedagogy is and understand human development. And then take branding to the next level. Start your personal branding strategy. What makes you special? Why are you an employee of the institution you're an employee of and how do you make yourself out there? And then take risks for attention. Attention, interest, desire, action. How do we get the attention of people so that they know that we're awesome? And then up your game. Like you, every University of Alberta student buys a library card to be a member of this library. What does your university strategy look like? What are you offering to them in terms of programming? Grow collections, investments, develop hybrid strategies, and then learn to sacrifice stuff. And some of the conversation circles we're gonna have here over the next couple of days are what programs are dogs, what are stars, what are cows, and what's a problem child or we don't know what to do with it or it's in its ambiguous moment. And you've probably seen that kind of chart, but how, how do we plot what you're doing? How do we understand what's happening in the growth cycle of, say, e-books e on that? They're about here now. Print books, about here. How do we understand where our community is on adopting things? And look at the difference between how much effort it takes to actually get laggers to use ebooks versus getting the skeptics on side. And yet the return on investment is pretty high. Let's have some more fun. And let's keep our critical thinking cap on, but amongst us chickens, I like it that it's a cat because it's a library audience. <laughs> you know, crazy cat lady is in the. The librarian, the uh, librarian action figure is the best-selling action figure at Archie McPhee, then Jesus, then uh, Crazy Cat Lady. <laughs> Two of them go to the same market. We aren't buying so many Jesus. So every day and every way you're throwing pebbles in the water and creating a ripple effect. You've got lots of things happening that will be up on the website. <laughs> <coughs> and we've got this challenge to bring our communities along. So let's not think in black and white. Let's recognize that the world is in shades of gray right now because those are the professional discussions. Color enters into it. Libraries are plaid. Libraries are paisley. 
we've got a bunch of black and white discussions that must end and turn into the full dimensions of where things really are. And I'll talk about that later, but you see, I just talk, talk, grocery stores, librarians are chefs and cookbooks, and the end user wants a meal. Can you describe your library in terms of what a meal is? Are you making it too hard for them? The big lie at Ikea is you can make something with just that. They lied to you. <laughs> but if we took the Ikea strategy to General Motors or libraries, but you go into our databases and you find these huge, oh look, we got 100 million articles. That's nice. Here's your Allen key. <laughs> so let's think. Stop seeing your users as their book behaviors and start seeing them as their goals. If you know what your users' goals are, your world will be a much better place. You've got lots of money, but putting a mouse on a book or putting a mouse on a catalog isn't the end result. It's a foundation strategy. Start channeling your inner shark and get out of your box. Start to measure things a little better. Statistics aren't cutting it for us. They don't tell us anything except where to cut. <coughs> I did that. So, choose. On the one hand, we want to make libraries survive. On the other hand, we want to make a difference in our communities. Which, where should we start? What should the front desk look like? Which one's going to get financed better? Take that third path. Take the risk. I don't want to be digging up library directors. I'm an archaeologist years from now and find out that this is what happened during this period in time. Librarians have to learn that we don't study things to death. Death is not our goal. We study things to do things. And we learn by doing. When you, you got a branding program, $180 for that bottle of perfume. It's smelly old liquid. <laughs> you don't pay $180 for that bottle because it's smelly old liquid. It's sex appeal, it makes you more attractive, or we believe it does. When we describe libraries as books and CDs, we're describing sex appeal as smelly yellow liquid. So, let's get our heads out of the sand and learn to tell our own story. Until the lions learn to write their own story, the story will always be from the perspective of the hunter, not the hunted. Let's make those powerful stories. It takes a long time when you're waiting by the side of a river for a roast duck to fly into your mouth. <laughs> Thanks. And I know I was bad. All the slides will be up. They're, they're, the slides that I left were just the summary slides and reading things. Okay. Pilar says I got 10 minutes for questions if anybody is, if I can get out of the light. See, someone has to break the air and prove that they can take a risk <laughs> instead of, oh my God, I'd be the first person to talk. Sorry. Anybody? Start. Great. <laughs> Is that okay? I wanted to thank you. Because, and I'm actually talking from a perspective of somebody who's managing outreach workers now in the library. Mm -hmm. So social workers. And the big joke when we started was, I'll show the customer where to find the cookbook, but I won't show them how to buy a flour or how to mix the mix the batter to make the make the cake. So I care, but he really cares. And I think what I'm starting to see is that this organization is starting to try and work towards those transformational encounters. And it's amazing how important that relationship is to the individual that the outreach workers are connecting with. Um, and we're starting to build that capacity. I'm going to an outreach conference to talk about the relationship of the library to social workers. They want a piece on technology. I think what they're looking for is how can an outreach worker use a database to make things better. I'm going to tell them that my technology is the wetware that's walking around the floor and has yeah. jeans on. And what we're able to do as libraries is show people the importance of the digital technology and getting underprivileged individuals connected to that and get them working with that and helping them to learn how to use it. Because there's still a lot of people that really can't fill out a form online. See, that's perfect. I love hearing that kind of passion. That's what we want to channel. And I, my insight or my magic sauce on outreach is not to call it outreach, but to call it reach. And in your head, think of what a handshake looks like. A handshake is two ways. 
and you buy permission to be an outreach person when you start to think of it as two-way and you listen and understand before you go out to tell them things. And libraries use the word outreach without uh, rethinking it in terms of it's a two-way street. You learn as much from the people you're reaching out to when they're reaching out back. Pam's got a mic. Okay, some of you are in my conversation circles for the next few days and you're probably holding off for that. But you're looking like that deer in the headlamps. You can tell me I was wrong. It's okay, I'm a big boy. Um, did I hear you say that um Barcodes are a barrier? I didn't quite catch that part. Uh, there's a lot of research showing that humans can only remember seven numbers. There's an article called The Magical Number Seven. The geeky people in this room probably have memorized their barcode number to get into the damn system. No, no, not the physical barcode. Actually using the little sucker yeah. is a horror. And sometimes we put things behind the barcodes that we don't need to, behind the authentication. And so if you look at uh, the authentication stuff, as a matter of fact, when I built the, micro the uh, iPhone and Android app for Gale, we took out all authentication and used uh, GIS authentication. And we had a number of libraries that we tested doing GIS education, but the librarians were quite against it because we might be giving content to people who aren't, don't have library cards. I thought that was an interesting point of view. <laughs> like, here's the publisher that owns the content saying we don't care about a little leakage and you're building barriers in to protect your library card, whatever. It's, to, me, to me, it's an interesting thing. I've often noticed that librarians are more afraid of success than they are of failure. We can't do online holds because it might double the number of people who borrow things from the library, which is what it tends to do. Oh yeah, that's what success looks like. What a horror. <laughs> I know you guys have evolved beyond that, but. <laughs> so I'm a library and information technology student. Yep, and what I, I know we had a lot of people from uh, Grant McEwen here, right? Yeah. Yeah, I've been there, it's a nice school. So my question is that it seems that you are saying that we should try things even though sometimes those things we try might offend some demographics? Yeah. Okay. That was my <laughs> We seem to have a, a certain cohort in society now that feel they get to tell the rest of society how to behave. Screw them. Like, you know, you don't get offensive, like maybe I am saying screw them, but you don't want to be offensive, but attracting attention, you know, like there was a really, like the library in England put uh, uh, the, the day after their parking signs on their parking lot, they put things underneath it in, uh, in town and it said no parking unless you're a monarch. <laughs> because you found them under the parking lot. Like, you know, that kind of stuff. It's, okay, you're making fun of a dead guy. You could maybe twist it. You know, like, you know, you got some opportunities. Like, you could sit there and say, you probably in this library have a book on the last time a pope abdicated. So when the pope abdicated today, gee, why don't we promote that book on our website? You follow the news. It might be offensive to a Catholic or two who just, you know, some people are born to be shocked and appalled at everything they see. <laughs> they're just shocked and appalled people. And it probably makes them feel alive. I don't know. But you know, I, I expect us to have judgment and not go too far over the fence, but not, go so, not be so afraid of being different that we look vanilla. Yell. <laughs> Just yell out. I can hear you. Right. I'm kind of a great tech student. Um, I was really looking forward to hearing you come out today, and you did not disappoint. I oh, appreciate thanks. that. Um, 
you were talking earlier on using YouTube. Yep. On using YouTube for children's uh, literature, for story time, other parts of an online presence of the librarian. I want mm -hmm. to see. I, I wanted to ask, how do you want to see online presence of libraries in the next few years in the future? Like, what What do you hope to see out of that? My basic principle around library online presence is that we've got the transaction model all built. I can find out if you got that book or not. That's nice. So great. You're at 1996. Good for you. What I want to see is social engagement strategies. So if you're engaging with communities as your priority on your website, then you're allowing commenting, engagement, book clubs. Uh, you know, sure you have to monitor it and every once in a while some evil victim will get in there and start swearing and you can just delete them. You know, no one's going to die. And so you just sit there and say, okay, what does engagement look like? And engagement looks like Talented people in the library recommending books in the context of the community recommending books. And then saying, okay, how do we start to say, I like that recommender? So within PPL Commons, if your staff at EPL, for instance, aren't competing to get one, two, or three stars, or whatever it is, as good recommenders that I want to follow, then what mark do you want? How do you want to be marked on social engagement? How are you connecting to, and who are you connecting to? Is the team librarian connecting to teens or to moms? I'm not saying one or the other is bad or good. It's just, what's your target, and how are you doing it, and how are you engaging? And the more we engaged, the more we build fans, the more we build supporters. I was really worried when the number one supporters of public libraries in the OCLC study were people who don't have library cards. <coughs> Pretty weird, eh? Maybe once they get to know us. <laughs> you know, we're, we're in charge of our own image. And I happen to know, when I'm going around the country at 100 conferences a year, that my peeps are pretty interesting. And you're really awesome. And that you don't share enough. Some people do. Like if you're Justin Hankey at Portland Public Library, he's over the top sharing. But he also engages communities and he's totally trusted. You see him with cohorts of people who are not, you know, Dutch blondes. <laughs> and he's with girls and boys and uh, kids who have, uh, he's helped kids with uh, family violence issues and made sure that they were safe. He's had the courage to deal with social community workers to help a kid deal with whatever was going wrong in their lives. And you look at some of us doing that kind of stuff that he, you know, he wouldn't ever break the confidence of the kid, but he can tell the story about the differences we make when you see somebody in trouble in your library. And that is really, really important to me. It was part of my childhood about what the library did to make me feel valued as a human being. And I think it's part of our role to engage with people at the stage of their life when there are problems. So when you see some senior coming into your library three times a week, it's not that they don't know how to take out six DVDs to watch at home. It's because you remember their name and say hi to them. And you're part of their social connection. And unless you can find a way to get those toothless tiger old men to stop picking on the teens, there are ways to do that, to sit there and say, OK, you need to work with them in the photography club. And you all can go out and take pictures of historic pictures and, or gravestones, and the seniors can type them all in. There's, ways of doing it where we change the community glue and the structure of how we play out in the world and deal with generational differences and racial differences and ethnic differences to make what I value in Canada this great big mosaic of awesomeness that, that, that we're part of. You got the hook? And on that <laughs> note, <laughs> as always, Stephen, you've been provocative and inspiring <coughs> and I think we're all in awe of your incredible energy and passion. I think we've been uh, very fortunate to have Stephen speak with us today. And if you would all join with me in thanking Stephen, and we thank will look you. forward to the next few days.